Well, good morning, Central Assembly. Whether you're here in the room or online, we want to welcome you today. Come on, let's stand and worship our God, our King together. God so loved the world, He sent His Son to save us. Come on, put your hands together with us. Come on, sing it with me. Come all you weary. Oh, come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Oh, drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come on, let's sing it together. Come all you sinners. Oh, come all you sinners. Come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come on, lift your voice together, we declare God so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. We declare His goodness, His faithfulness, His mercy, His unfailing love today. You meet our needs, Lord. Oh. Come on, sing it with me. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. We'll see you. wonderful to join together and just declare the truth. God loves us and he gave his son for us and let's let the addictions break. Let's let, let's let discouragement break today. Let's let life come as we're in his presence and 
marvelous to be with all of you today. We welcome you, middle of the vacation season, but if vacations have brought you here as a first-time guest, we are so glad you decided to join us for worship. And everybody else who's not on vacation, bless you, good to see you, and we're, we're just going to have a great day today. We're going to move things around a little bit. Um, in a few minutes, I'm going to be bringing God's Word first, the message first, and then we're going to be finishing our core values series and taking communion as a church family to cap that off and then responding with our worship time, our sung worship time. And so we're going to have a great day today. Just before I have you greet one another, however, you can be seated. There is a point of prayer we're going to come to in just a moment. I'd like Jill McDaniel, Pastor Jill, to come. And uh, many of you know Jill. She's been a part of the church probably 20 years almost, right? And amazing family, three kids. Married to Pastor Carter, that's a trial, but uh, uh, this made a good woman out of you. <laughs> when Pastor Hannah left as our elementary pastor, our children's pastor last year, um, Jill stepped in to be the interim. She's highly qualified. She writes curriculum for national children's ministries, including the Assemblies of God, and she's had years of experience working with kids. and. Um, she's just done amazing. I mean, our children's ministry has just prospered under her leadership and so much trust from parents. But she only did it interim. She made that pretty clear to us. So we were looking all over and we interviewed people, but we couldn't find anybody who we thought just was the right person like Jill is. So in a spiritual journey in her own life, she's finally come to say she is willing to have the interim lifted off her title and to be our elementary pastor. Um, thank you for the love and support and the grace that you have extended to me over the past year. I have grown so much, and I have seen God doing a work in my life. And God has given me such a love for our kids, um, our kids who are here, and also he's turned my eyes to the kids that he wants us to bring in as well. Um, I've seen God doing a work in our kids' lives, laying a foundation of truth that they can stand on solidly for the rest of their lives, and our older kids um, taking ownership of their relationship with God. And um, I am so honored and humble and excited to be able to get to be a part of seeing God continue that work, both in their lives and in, in, and in my life as well. So thank you so much for this amazing opportunity. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Yeah. You're deserving of that, and we're grateful. Um, you're going to be on our pastoral team. You're credentialed as somebody's a God minister as well, and uh, we, we love working with you. Let's reach our hand out to Jill. Father, thank you. Thank you for men and women of God that you put your hand on and you use. And thank you for the amazing ways you've been working through, Jill, these last few months. Thank you, Lord, for the growth. Thank you for all the young families you've been adding recently to the life of the church and for the great growth in our kids' ministry. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll, you'll could just let this just be the beginning. And I pray she'll feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit on her life. Pray you'll give her favor as she recruits and cares for volunteers and children's ministry. And I pray, God, that you will raise her up. She'll lead many children to you to find you and to children to be filled with your spirit, children to be equipped in the word of God, children to feel the love of God as we love them. And may you just use her in a great way. We just commission her now to her work among us to serve our children and our families and our whole church family as a pastor, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for Jill one more time. Bless you. Yeah. And just before you're seated, why don't you just turn and uh, introduce yourself. If you don't know somebody, welcome them to church today. God bless you.
Good morning and welcome to Central. If you're a guest this week, we're honored that you're with us. Come say hello at the Central Hub in the lobby. Or if you're with us online, just click the Connect With Us button on your screen. Also, now is a great time for everyone to visit centralassembly.org on your mobile device for today's message notes and more details on all of today's announcements. Summer has been a great season here at Central, but we're excited to be heading quickly toward the fall, and we've got just a few events to keep you aware of in the coming weeks. Starting this Wednesday at 6.45 p.m., we welcome back pastor, author, and friend of Central, Chase Repligal, for a four-week series in the chapel that we think everyone is going to love. Chase will take an in-depth look at the masculine instincts presented in his recently published book and how they affect both men and women. You won't want to miss Chase's insight on things like ambition, adventure, reputation, and apathy, and how these instincts aren't necessarily a curse or a virtue, but instead experiences by which we can develop a new and better instinct of faith. And if you visit the event page on centralassembly.org, you'll find a link to a free online quiz that will provide you with your own instinct profile. Again, that class kicks off this Wednesday at 6.45 p.m. in the chapel, and both men and women are invited to join in. Now, specifically for all you Central women out there, we're excited to announce the Flourish Women's Conference happening September 9th and 10th. You'll have opportunities to spend time together socially, worshiping with each other led by recording artists Brad and Rebecca, and hear from powerful speakers like Missionary to Vienna, Melinda Henderson, and Project Rescue's Beth Grant. Tickets are only $25, and you can register online at centralassembly.org right now. There are also invite cards available throughout the foyer. So think of a friend now and invite them to join Central Women for Flourish September 9th and 10th right here at Central. In just a moment, Pastor Jim is coming to wrap up our Kings and Values series talking about King Hezekiah and having a God-sized footprint. God has a bigger plan than anything we can see or even imagine. We believe that when all of us start with hearts that are hungry for God, living with attentive eyes and linked arms, and giving with open hands, we can leave a God-sized footprint in the world around us. One of the ways we do that is through our Footprint Fund. Footprint Fund is where we can give over and above our tithe to make a God-sized footprint in the world. When you give to Footprint Fund, you are putting your money to work serving the mission of God through two main components, a generational footprint and a global footprint. Our generational footprint builds the church for years to come. Through your giving, we fund college ministries like Chi Alpha at Missouri State University and Drury University, as well as our own college ministry programs. You also support Christian higher education at Evangel University and fund an internship program right here at Central for Evangel's ministry students. Footprint Fund also provides scholarships for camps to our own elementary and youth students who need assistance to attend our summer camp programs. Our global footprint supports around 200 missionaries and ministries that are spreading the message of Jesus' love and the gospel to 53 countries around the world. But we also impact our local area through work with neighboring schools, as well as partnerships with organizations like Victory Mission, Freedom City Church, and others to reach our community in lasting ways. Footprint Fund also allows us to take on special missions projects like a church plant in Paris, France, and ongoing giving to emergency refugee work around the Ukraine crisis. It also allowed us to send a team to Italy this summer to assist local churches with an ESL Vacation Bible School that reached out to unchurched children in Naples. When you give to Footprint Fund, you are truly making an impact in the world. If you've given to Footprint Fund, we want to say thank you. Your giving continues to make all of this possible. If you've never given to Footprint Fund, I'd ask that you prayerfully consider it. You can find out more and give anytime at centralassembly.org slash give. You can also give in person using the secure drop boxes near the doors when you exit. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving and for leaving a God-sized footprint in our world. 
Now, let's turn our hearts to God's Word as Pastor Jim comes. A God-sized footprint. I brought one of my shoes. My shoes leave footprints sometimes where my wife doesn't prefer them, like on the carpet. But you leave a footprint wherever you go. And uh, I, I don't know all of your stories. I, don't, I know some of your stories, but I can probably say with some certainty that every one of you are following in somebody else's footprint right now. And there have been footprints that have marked your life Some of you very destructively. Some of you have had backgrounds of addiction and abuse and ways in which you were victimized and they've left very damaging footprints. Others of you um, have, have had people leave footprints in your life that have caused you to flourish as a human being and to flourish in your relationship with the Lord. Now, shoes. I have, as some of you know, Sandy and I have one grandson and he is just learning to walk now, but he's a speed crawler. That guy can crawl faster than you could believe. And he's fascinated with shoes. And so what he does is he'll take, like he's done this with my shoes, he'll take his shoes and he'll, he'll put one hand in that shoe and the other hand in the other shoe and just start crawling. I mean, he just loves this. He just crawls along, clopping along with our shoes. And and I, I, I just have, have to think that there's a little guy who's going to grow up following other people's footprints as well. And I, I want him to follow godly footprints. That's why we're trying to be good grandparents and pray for that little guy like every day and, and care for our family. And we're all involved in leaving footprints and we're all involved in following in people's footprints. And it's the fifth of our five core values as a church family. You can see them all in the lobby, illustrated for you and named. And, and the fifth one kind of, kind of ties up all of the other ones. And I've especially been excited to come to King Hezekiah. With every footprint, we've been identifying one of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem uh, centuries ago. And we've been looking at various kings out of Second Chronicles, and today, King Hezekiah. And I love this verse. This verse is the whole nine yards in one verse when it comes to the influence of our lives. The Second Chronicles chapter 31. The story of Hezekiah starts in 29. It's like three, at least three full chapters. But here's the summary of his life. Chapter 31, verse 21. In everything that he, Hezekiah, undertook in the service of God's temple and in obedience to the law and the commands... He sought his God and worked wholeheartedly. And then what happened was that God prospered him. And so he prospered. And that's why his footprint was more than just a man-made footprint. His footprint became a God-sized footprint because God prospered him. Now, I've actually talked about this verse with business leaders. I just think this is the key. I think if you want to wrap up one verse that is the quote-unquote formula for success, it's right here. He did two things. He sought God and he worked hard. Now, isn't that a duo right there? Now, someone said we ought to pray like we can't work and work like we can't pray. Well, that's exactly what Hezekiah did. He sought God, but his faith, his seeking of God, didn't make him passive. He worked hard. And he put both those things together. I want to tell you, if you go to your job and you seek God and you work hard, who knows Who knows the doors might open up for you and the influence you might leave. And this was Hezekiah. This is how he summed up all of Hezekiah's life as a king. He sought God and he worked hard. And so God prospered. And it reminded me of what my friend of years ago, Jeff Heward, uh, said uh, in a a lecture, in a talk he was giving. He, He said, God is looking for people who have these three traits. First of all, they know what they're living for. If you know what you're living for, like we'll see Hezekiah did, um, that sets you apart from the crowd right there. Very few people have really thought through what they're really living for. 
and the purpose of their life. Secondly, you not only know what you're living for, but you live it 100%. In the midst of a world that can feel sometimes like it's like a bunch of 50 percenters around us, we live 100%. And then thirdly, you change your surroundings rather than just yielding to them, just giving into them. You don't just take on the colors of your surroundings, you affect the colors of your surroundings. Or in that old analogy, you're not a thermometer just reflecting the ambient conditions around you. You're a thermostat. Wherever you go, you're setting the temperature, not just reflecting the temperature. You're a thermostat and not a thermometer. And, and so people who leave a footprint are, are people who, who change their surroundings rather than just yielding to them because they know what they're living for and they're living at 100%. And Hezekiah did this. He sought God and he worked hard. He, he, he knew what he was living for. And he worked hard at 100% at it. And as a result, he left an incredible footprint, pieces of which we still have 2,700 years later in our world. And, and it's an Hezekiah's footprint was impressive. Um, first of all, he brought about spiritual renewal. His father was perverted. That's about the best thing you can say about him. And this is one of those situations like we find often in Chronicles. Sometimes you will see good kings have bad sons, but in this case we see a bad king that has a good son. So take heart, all you parents who feel like you weren't perfect. God can still, can still raise up your kids. And Hezekiah's father left a mess in Jerusalem, um, economically and spiritually. And so Hezekiah led a whole spiritual renewal. Look what it says in verse 35 of chapter 30. So the service of the Lord's temple was reestablished. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced at what God had brought about for his people. It was a God-sized thing. What God had brought. They were rejoicing that God had brought this spiritual turnaround in, in Israel because it was done so quickly. So in Jerusalem and Judah, there was this massive spiritual that happened not over a long period of time, but God clearly stepped in to, to a king who sought God and worked hard. God stepped in and prospered him. And a spiritual renewal happened so quickly that people were amazed. I, I believe that could happen in any church. God would just, it's God's moment. And he steps in. And this happened with Hezekiah. And then he restored the Passover. Now, the Passover is a really important feast in, 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 in Old Testament Judaism because it represented one of the most significant events in Jewish history. That's when they were delivered out of Egypt. And, and they, put the, 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 they, they would take the blood of a sacrificed lamb and put it over, over, the, the, the door, over the doorposts of their home. And the angel of judgment... Uh, which came to actually allow Egypt to set Israel free from slavery, the angel of judgment would pass over them when they saw the blood. That's why we call it Passover, and it was a picture of Jesus who, who no coincidence, was crucified at Passover because his blood shed for us. When we take his blood to ourselves, judgment passes over us, and only mercy comes our way. Thank God for that. And so this was an incredibly important celebration. It was the celebration that would picture Jesus and his work for us. And, and it had been neglected. And normally the pilgrims would come in and they'd have this huge celebration for Passover. And it had been neglected for years and years and years. Hezekiah, through his seeking of God and his hard work, restored it. It was a massive effort and restored the celebration of Passover. And verse 26, at the end of that Passover of uh, chapter 30, there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the days of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. I mean, since King Solomon, they had never seen a Passover celebration like this. I mean, this guy was leaving a footprint. And then the whole issue of national security, this is where we have still some lingering evidences of his footprint. In, uh, in chapter 32, we read about the Assyrians attacking and threatening to attack. They'd been moving in. They'd been conquering every other people, group, and nation, and city. Now they were focusing on Jerusalem. They were saying, they were sending threatening letters saying, who do you think you are to think you and your God can stand up to us? Because so far, our gods have won us every victory. We, we, and they were like the, wor the world superpower in that era. And uh, 
And look what Hezekiah says in, 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 in verse 7 of chapter 32. Be strong and courageous, and do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. This king who sought God, he just encouraged everybody who's afraid, of course, and he just said, look, I think this is what John picked out when in the New Testament, in 1 John 4, 4, he said, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He, he encouraged the people with, with you know what? <laughs> There's someone with us, the, the creator God, the God of heaven and earth, who's greater than their gods. And so this God-seeking king call his people to rely on the Lord. But he not only did that, he worked hard as well. He took, because the spring, the main water source, the Gion Springs, the main water source of Jerusalem were just out of kind of the southeast side of the city of Jerusalem. He encompassed that in, and he cut a tunnel that's known today as Hezekiah's Tunnel to supply water in so that the Assyrians wouldn't be able to cut off their water supply. I've actually walked through that tunnel. It's still there today. And then he broadened the the walls around Jerusalem, and, um, and you can see excavations today, 2,700 years later, of Hezekiah's wall. I mean, he, he did things to fortify, just like we trust God to protect us, but we probably still put a seatbelt on when we get in the car. I mean, it's seeking God and working hard. It's God's part and our part all together. I mean, Hezekiah did this in an amazing way and left this incredible footprint. And if you will read in Isaiah 36 and 37, because Isaiah was the prophet living in Jerusalem during this time, he comes along, he links arms with Hezekiah, and they end up seeing a great victory happen against, against the uh, Assyrians. And you get the backstory in chapters 36 and 37 of Isaiah. Well, so whether it's spiritual renewal or, 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 or the, the Passover celebration or the national security issues, I mean, this king left an incredible imprint. I mean, you could see his imprint all over, all over the nation because he sought God and he worked hard. Wow. And we want to leave a God-sized footprint by seeking God and working hard ourselves. Can I hear an amen in the house? We want to leave a God. And thank you, Pastor Josh, for that wonderful video where you outlined. I mean, we want to leave a generational input, imprint. I mean, Jesus was like this. At, at times... You know, one time it says he got really angry. Why did, he get, why did Jesus get really angry? Because he found out the disciples were quietly pushing the young families away from Jesus because they thought children would be a waste of his time and in the way. And that's one place in the Bible Jesus actually gets angry and says, no, let those kids come to me because they look more like the kingdom of God than you grown-ups in your inflated egos. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. And so we're, we're committed. Thank you for all our nursery volunteers, preschool volunteers, elementary school volunteers, working with Pastor Jill, all our middle school pa uh, uh, volunteers, all our high school pastors uh, and volunteers. I mean, our staff, our volunteers, we are committed to raising up a generation, a generation. We're going to, in our footprint celebration, in our footprint mission celebration in the middle of middle of October, we're, we're going to be, one week we're going to have, we're going to have De Devin and Ruthie Lolly with us, and Devin, Ruthie's my niece, but Devin grew up here at Central, some of you were Sunday school teachers and nursery care work volunteers, I mean, Devin is now leading a team of people to plant a church in an unreached part of the world, um, th this is what happens when we invest in kids, and then the next Sunday we're going to have Jennifer and John Barrett who are taking over leadership of, uh, of a marvelous ministry, Project Rescue, uh, reaching traffic women all over the world. And they are products of our church. They're still a part of our church as they base here out of Springfield. I mean, this, this is it, generational. And I'm so grateful. They're all pretty young people. And we're going to be focusing on October, uh, in October on the next generation that God's raising up to take the world for Christ. Uh, we want to leave a generational footprint. And we want to leave a global footprint. There's still two and a half billion people that will never meet a Christian in their entire life, let alone ever see or be able to attend a church. But God is raising us up to take the gospel all around the world. I have a book here. It's uh, written by a friend of mine, Mark Doreen, who preached here a couple, three years ago. 
Uh, I've known Mark for many years and his wife Janie. I did their wedding when we were all a part of a university church together at University of Minnesota. And he has been called to the Buddhist world. He recently wrote a book called Change the Map. Not the physical map, Change the Spiritual Map. And he is now leading a global movement to raise up intercessors and, and, and prayer for the Buddhist world. Just like happened 30 years ago with the Muslim world, where now we're starting to see breakthroughs as people continue to pray for the Muslim world. Now he's leading a movement. Uh, change the map. This, this is a footprint initiative. This is what God does. And part of one of the mission he's one of the missionaries you support when you give to Footprint Fund. And then some of you know Pastor Dan Betzer, who is one of the most famous communicators in in the Assemblies of God, our church family, as well as one of the most famous Christian communicators in our world. And he pastors a mega church in Fort Myers, at least till recently. He just retired. And he wrote a book. He said, Why some churches why some churches are blessed. Why are some churches blessed? And uh, I, know, I know Pastor Betzer personally. He's been a wonderful encouragement to me. He especially was an encouragement to me when I was considering coming back to pastor here at Central because he was a part of Central years ago. And he's passionate about the local church. And he's got a really good introduction. He said, I had this guy. He drove hundreds of miles to come and visit me in Fort Myers and ask me what the secret of our church's success was. And he said, I really deflated him. He said, I had a one-word answer, missions. Amen. Or we would say in two words, global footprint. Amen. He said, the guy just sat there deflated. He said, no, no, pastor, I don't want to hear about that. I, I didn't drive hundreds of miles to hear about missions. Come on, what's the open sesame secret? of your church? How come thousands of people attend here? How come you're not in debt? How, how did you build a multi-billion dollar state-of-the-art children's center debt-free? How could you be on local television every day and national television every week and not be begging for money on the air? Like, what's the secret, Pastor? Please tell me. He said, I look, Dan said, I looked at him for a moment, smiled again, and responded, missions. Because after all, I had to tell him the truth. <laughs> and I just believe this. I believe if we make our top priority God's heart to reach every, every unreached people group in the world, Amen. he's going to throw heaven behind it. He does. And, and that's why he said why some churches are blessed. It's a one-word answer. It's not just for us. It's missions. It's giving to that. Some of you have given your whole lives to that. Others of us. I used to beg God to be a missionary and not have to preach to American Christians all the time. I'm sorry about that. I'm just being honest. But God said, well, I am concerned about my global footprint, but your call is not necessarily go, but it's to equip and send. And I just want to be a part of a place that has a global footprint. And that's what we're doing. And what will that take? Well, I noticed three things about Hezekiah's life as we close. Just three things that have to do with it. Remember, he sought God and he worked hard. These have to do with the work hard part, the work hard part. First of all, I noticed... If we're going to leave an imp a, a footprint like that, if we're going to have huge shoes that will leave a footprint that will last generations and reach the nations, first of all, I'm impressed that Hezekiah didn't make this all about himself. You can't think about your influence on the world around you and always be thinking about yourself. And I, I want to tell you, a self-fixated life is one of the most depressing kind of lives I could imagine. In fact, you want to be depressed, just live a self-fixated life. That's not the only reason for depression, but it certainly will put you in depression, where everything's about you, everything revolves around you. Probably the most best-selling Christian book, uh, other than the Bible, was Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life. And sentence number one of that book was, it's not about you. Pastor Warren just puts it right in our face. It's not about you. This is how Hezekiah lived. Notice in, when we're first as, um, introduced to Hezekiah in, in chapter 29, verse 3, in the first month of the first year of his reign, so not even within the first 100 days of his presidency, but in the first 30 days of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and he repaired them. It does not say in the first 30 days of his reign, Hezekiah first of all started to build his palace. No. It had nothing to do with him. Or verse 10, a few verses later. Now, I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, Hezekiah said, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. 
And, and, and I love it that Hezekiah tried to answer the right questions. If, if we're trying to answer the wrong questions, there's a lot of frustration, and we don't leave the imprint that we could leave. I mean, the wrong question for Hezekiah would be, um, how, how can I use my position as a king to increase my net worth? How, how could I use my, my, my position over as commander-in-chief of an army to expand my territory? How, how, how could I... How, how, could I, um, how could I use my power to get everything I've ever wanted? No. Th those were the wrong questions. The right question was this. Why has God taken his hand off our nation? Why has God lifted his blessing off of us? That's the question he answered. And he did it by saying, by saying, I'm going to make a covenant with the Lord because we've sinned against him and we need to come back to him and we need his hand upon us. He didn't even ask the question, how can I rebuild this nation? He asked the right question, how come God's taken his blessing off of us? And this is not, this is not an it's all about me question. You've heard me, some of you have talked in the past about the difference between success and significance. I hope you're all successful at work. I hope you all succeed in your ministry. The problem with success, however, is it can remain all about you. You succeed for your own benefit. But significant, when God takes us from success on to significance, and we're no longer preoccupied by just being successful, but we're preoccupied about the footprint that we are leaving, then we're thinking significance. And significance is not about us. It's about the people around us and the influence and the imprint we're leaving on their lives. So Hezekiah didn't make it about himself. And also, in that process, Hezekiah let it cost him something. I mean, personally, he let it cost him something to leave a footprint. And as they're restoring the temple, and then those temples been restored in chapter 31, it says now they've got to finance the ongoing work of God and the worship of God. And so in verse 3, it says the king contributed. This always moves me as a leader. The king contributed from his own possessions. He let it cost him something. For the morning and evening burnt offerings, for the burnt offerings on the Sabbaths and the new moons and the appointed festivals as written in the law. And it's not until he's first contributed from his own possessions as a leader that then he ordered the people living in Jerusalem, next verse, to give the portion to the priests and the Levites so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. And um, you may not be a leader, but here's how you think if you're going to be a person who wears a shoe that leaves a footprint in other people's lives, you decide up front, before it's other people making the sacrifice, I'm going to make the sacrifice. And in fact, the result of that was when Hezekiah, verse 8, when Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed his people Israel. I always smile when I read that verse because when I think heaps, I think of garbage. Heaps of garbage. No. These weren't heaps of garbage. These were heaps of offerings that the people had given. And at the bottom of those heaps were the first offerings that Hezekiah gave himself. And it's all of this that, that we start, as, as Oswald Sanders said in his classic book, Spiritual Leadership, I used to have my campus ministry, my university ministry interns when I was at the University of Minnesota uh, read that book. And I read it for the first time in my mid-20s. And there's one sentence that was worth the whole book to me, although it's kind of a Christian classic. And in it, Sanders says, the true spiritual leader seeks to put more into life than he or she ever intends to take out of life. I've had two times in my life where I've read something and I thought, if I would dare to live this way for the rest of my life, I mean, who knows what God could do. And so I remember making up my mind in my mid-20s, I'm going to live that way. I'm not going to do things just because I'll get as much or more back. I mean, when I buy something for $10, I want it to be worth $10. And if it's worth $12, I'll be very happy because I got a deal. But I don't want to put across $10 if it's only worth $8. But Sanders said, 
if you're going to make an imprint for God, doesn't matter if you have a leadership title or not, if you're going to make an imprint for God, you decide up front that you're going to put more in than you ever expect to get back. And some of you are living that way right now. Some of you, you're volunteering here, and we'll never be able to write you enough thank you notes in return. I remember one time I was complaining because I didn't think I got enough thank you notes. I, I'm ashamed of my wicked heart there, but, you know, because I didn't, I, sometimes this would slip out of kilter for me. I didn't think I was getting enough thank you notes. And the Lord would say to me, hmm, I didn't think you were doing this for the appreciation. I thought you were doing this for me. And you know what? There comes a point where we don't bar bargain and negotiate with God. If you're going to have an influence, you decide first up, up front. I don't know if people will respond. I don't know if I'll get a thank you note for this. But I'm going to decide up front to put more into life than I hope to take out of it and then leave myself in the care of the Lord who like, who like Hezekiah, it says, and so, and so God prospered him. And so Hezekiah didn't make it about himself. I think that's essential if we're going to have a footprint. And if you're going to have an influence, you're going to have to decide up front it's going to cost you something. And then... You're going to have to marry faith with action. you got to actually not just have faith, but do something. Not just pray, but do something. And this, and this is where it came down to. Hezekiah married faith with action. So here's our starting verse. In everything he undertook, in the service of God's temple, and in obedience to the law and the commands, he sought his God, and he, say those words out loud, Worked wholeheartedly. He sought God and he worked hard. And he did something. He just didn't worship God. He did something in Jesus' name. And that's really what our core values have been. So as we prepare, I wanted to end our core values series by, as a church family, taking communion together. Because God didn't make, I mean, Jesus said, I didn't come for me. I came to give my life away. Cost him a lot at the cross. But in his name, we want to be that kind of church. And here's where we've been. We've been walking through our five core values. It started with King Josiah and having that hungry heart for him. How Josiah, at 16 years old, began to seek the Lord. Like I believe a prophetic Josiah class generation is being raised up. And then, and then we looked at those attentive eyes we saw King Asa, how God says to him, the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth, looking for someone whose hearts he can strongly encourage and strengthen. And, and, and as a result, we have a ten of eyes for one another. And, and, and then we looked at linked arms. We looked at Joseph, King Joash's mentor. And as long as that mentor was in his life, he stayed right with God. And, and, and he walked away from God after his mentor died. But but how important just to link arms with each other. We, we need each other to walk together. And a hungry heart for God will give us Jesus' eyes for the people around us. And Jesus' eyes will, will cause us to want to link arms with one another in relationship and discipleship. And, and then it'll open our hands. It'll pry these fingers open until we say, here. And it's not about us anymore. And then all of this, and we looked at that with King Joash's box. And then, and then finally, it all culminates in... In influence. I mean, all, you can't do those first four without having an influence. And, and remember, when, when we ended that, that linked arms message, I said, never, never underestimate the potential of your influence when you come along people in Jesus' name. And we do all of this in honor of Jesus and his mission. Jesus and his mission to leave an imprint to leave a God-sized footprint. This is what we get to do. We get to not just be here for us. We get to leave a God-sized imprint on our kids and our grandkids, on our friends, on our working associates, and on our church, and on the nations of the world. We get to leave an imprint for Jesus' glory and the sake of his mission. Hallelujah. Because it was Jesus who didn't say, you will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will. Hezekiah saw God and worked hard. And so God prospered him. And I just believe God is going to help us to see his church built and his church grow.
I'd like you to take your communion cups, if you would. And would you just take the side that has the bread and open the lid and take that bread and hold it in your hands. This bread speaks to me about footprint in every way. It means that the God who created the natural universe then became a citizen of the natural universe. He confined himself to space and time and even a real body like you and I have so he could meet us where we are and he could be broken so that we would be healed. This is what he did at the cross. And uh, this is what we do when we leave a footprint. We enter people's worlds. We, we go where the gospel hasn't gone. We don't make life all about us. And uh, this is what Jesus did when he took on flesh, when he took on a body. So, Lord Jesus, as your living church, we commit ourselves, Lord, afresh with your strength to be like you who said, I will build my church. Thank you for coming. Thank you for walking with us. Thank you for life. We praise you. We love you. We honor you today. And we take the bread in honor of you and we glorify you in honor of you, Jesus, in honor of your mission, in honor of what you've done for us. Thank you. In Jesus' name. And we pray as we take the bread, you'll put big shoes on us today. Amen. Let's take the bread together. Then would you take the cup and Let's open up the other side. This cup represents Jesus' blood. The night before Jesus was crucified, he said, he said, take this cup. This is the new covenant in my blood. Remember, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's the judgment of God. So we could be forgiven. We could have grace. It's by his blood that we're purchased from Satan's ownership in this world. And we can actually belong to God. We can be a part of something bigger than ourselves. We, we can actually be forgiven in spite of ourselves. And if you don't know Jesus, I, I just encourage you this moment to just turn to the Lord. Repent of living a self-focused life. And just give your life to living a Jesus-centered life, to following him. It's the greatest thing you'll ever do. And the rest of us, let's just be grateful. If there's unconfessed sin in your life, or if there's wrong attitudes towards people around you, Let's, uh, let's ask him to forgive us. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you make us one. As we've talked about our core values, this is what we're trying to become as a church family. And We pray if there's unforgiveness, if there's division anywhere in our hearts to others in the family, you just forgive us like you forgave us through the shedding of your blood. And help us, O oh God, to be one in Christ. Lord, let continue to thank you for the wonderful unity we do experience because of you. And may it just continue. May your, your blood continue to unite us heart to heart with one another and always heart to heart with you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Let's take the cup together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. We honor you, Lord, today. Mighty God, great King. Thank you. We get to live, Lord, for you, Jesus, and to share in your mission, to leave footprints for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. I'd like to invite you to stand. Worship team now is going to lead us in just some lingering in the presence of God songs of prayer and hunger for the Lord and, and let's let this be a powerful time and I'd like our prayer partners if you would come if as we sing these, these couple of three songs together and have our worship time uh, as we lift song we, we just I just want to invite you if you'd like prayer for anything if you need to start a relationship with Jesus or you need healing or you need God's intervention somewhere these people know how to pray with you in faith and uh, see what God can do when he steps in. Or you're just praying for how God is going to be using you in the days ahead. You just want to leave big foot footprints. It would be a good day to come and pray with someone about that. Or if while we're worshiping, you just want to come to the altar. There's 
gaps in between here and there's room in some of the front seats. If you just want to come and kneel or just stand in the altar area and just seek God, if you feel that you just want to take that step towards the Lord as we sing and we receive God's grace and sing these prayers to the Lord, you feel free. We're just going to wait on the Lord. I'll close in a little while our service and dismiss those of you who would like to go. But let's just linger in His presence. Let's just wait on Him today in Jesus' name.
it again. Oh, precious. Oh, and oh, precious is the flow that makes me wise. for his blood. Thank you that he washes us clean. Come on, in your own words, let his praise just gently be on your lips today. God, thank you. Worship. Every stain you've washed away. You took them all, God. You took them all. Jesus, we're thankful for your blood. Thankful for your blood. Thank you, God. Come on, lift that, oh, precious. And oh, precious, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No Precious are you, Jesus. Precious are you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, dwell in our midst. We just want more of you. Can you tell them that this morning? God, I just want more of you. More of your presence, more of who you are. More of your grace, more of your mercy. You freely give to us. Jesus, we surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. my surrender. Come on, let's lift this together. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you to do whatever this room be an altar this morning where, where you're at maybe you want to come forward or spread out just to tell God God I want more of you I'm surrendering my life to you I seek only you God let that be today here is where I lay it down every burden every crown this is my surrender this is my surrender here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. We make room. And I will make room 
Church, in your own words, could you let him hear your affections this morning? Yes, Lord. Yes, could you lay your affections on our Hallelujah, King, Lord. our Lord today? Amen. Jesus. As the Lord's moving among us, uh, I didn't do this first service, but I just keep feeling prompted to invite you to come and stand together at this altar area. If, 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 if yes, Lord, I surrender to you and, and sing this. This next song we'll be singing as a prayer to the Lord and I just you don't have to come, but if you just like to come and stand here shoulder to shoulder as Christ's living church and say, we're here, Lord. We're here for you, and we're surrendered to you and to, to you to make a difference through our lives. It's just, it's just sometimes you just need to take a step and just invite you as we just continue to worship the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Our fictions are for God. God, we long for more. God, we long for more, oh God. This world could never satisfy the longing in my soul. When all is lost and hope is dry, when all I feel is cold, I'm coming back to your presence. Yes. I'm coming back to your presence. 
in our family. Come and do what only you can do. So through the gifts of the Spirit, what an invitation. Would you just receive right now? In the name of the Lord, just be filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Just receive the gift. Lord, we need you. How we need you, Lord. And yet, how full and present you are, oh God. When we come humbly to you, hallelujah. Fill our old hearts, Lord, with your Spirit, we prayed, overflowing. Lord, you said out of our innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Let the rivers of your spirit flow through us, O oh God. We're nothing without this, but Lord, by your spirit, O oh God, fill with your spirit, Lord. Set us afire for you and ready for your work. And Lord, let your spirit, which you've given us, flow through us, O oh God, in these days. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Because we need you, Lord. We need, I need you. We need you, Lord. I 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 need you, Lord. How we long for you. How we long desperate for thirsty for you, hungry for you, Lord. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, I want more. I want more. And I need. Oh, I need thee. And every hour I need thee. And oh, bless me now. Come on, our Savior, my Savior. Oh, I come. Sing that again, I need, for I need Thee, oh, I need Thee, every hour, oh, we need You, Lord, in every hour, oh, I need Thee, and oh, Church declared today, I need
I had the opportunity to pray with a few of you as we were worshiping, and uh, but I'd just like to ask you, and you can do this if you're standing near somebody or sitting near, you just lay your hand on the shoulder of someone beside you. And Father, as a, we're your family, we're your people. Just pray for our brother, our sister. We need them to be strong for you, Lord. We need them leaving a footprint of of supernatural dimension, Lord. We, 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 we need their encouragement and their accountability, and we need, Lord, them, and we just pray you'll make them large in your spirit. And you just fill them, Lord, today. Lord Jesus, just pour through them, Lord. Just let the anointing of the Holy Spirit be upon their lives. Let their hearts burn with the fire of God. Open doors for them. Make way for them, we pray. And we pray that the power of darkness to slow them down will be broken in Jesus' name. And this spiritual warfare will be put away and that, you, Lord, you will break through even today in fresh ways. Let faith rise in their heart, hope and joy in the Holy Spirit, and righteousness and holiness. And my God, they'll be hedged in by your Spirit. You'll be a shield about them. And you'll be the glory and the lifter of their heads. We just pray for our brothers and sisters. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you we walk with each other through this, Lord. And we praise you in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Could we sing that one more time? I need you. I need you. Oh, I need you. I was praying for two or three of you. I felt very distinctly the Lord is bringing you into a broad place. In the Psalms it says, we've walked through, men have ridden over our heads, we've gone through fire and water, but you have brought us into a broad place. And I, I just feel that's for numbers of us, bringing you into a broad, a broad place is just a place where you're just breathing easy again, and uh, the oppression isn't there. And the broad place is the place of opportunity, and and where, where you're just not striving and struggling, but you're just kind of in the flow. And, um, and he's just with you, and he's the wind in your back, and you're just watching God work. And so broad places, I just want you to be open to broad places. We need him, and he is taking us to broad places. Hallelujah for that. Hallelujah. Uh, Pastor Josh, you may lead us a little more. Um, I'd like to dismiss those of you who would like to go. Worship team is going to continue to lead. Please feel welcome just to linger here if you'd like. But it's been so great to be with you to worship today. Thank you for lingering as we spend time in God's presence. It's one of the most important things we do. And uh, God bless you. May you go in Jesus' name. And uh, you're welcome to linger. We'll continue to worship. Thank you. Because there's a hunger in a third. I am desperate, immerse me, and I'm not waiting, not anymore, oh, I need you, Lord, I need you, come on, there's a hunger, there's a hunger, and a thirst, and I am desperate. Oh, 
come that way. Not anymore. We need you, Lord. Oh, I need you, Lord. Oh, I need you. Oh, there's a hunger. Oh, oh there's a hunger. Oh, and a thirst. Oh, I am desperate. Oh, we embrace me. And I'm not way. Not anymore. of God. 